And hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. This is Jake. I will be your host, your moderator, and uh, we have a very special guest for you today and a very special topic. Um, before I introduce all of that, I do want to uh, cover the house cleaning items just so that we're all aware. Um, if you are in full screen mode and you want to get out of that, there's definitely a little um, minimize view option up there at the top. And then if you want to ask any questions, the questions are in the Q&A box down at the bottom. And there's also a chat window as well. We ask that you leave the banter in the chat window and leave all questions in the Q&A box so that we can get those answered appropriately. So the today's topic, as you can see, is understanding water conservation. And we do have a very special person to present that for us today. Greg Rosink is um, with Hunter and he has graciously accepted to talk about this topic. Um, definitely an important one here in uh, California and definitely spreading throughout um, other states too. So a little bit about Greg. He is a graduate of San Diego State University and has worked for Hunter Industries for nearly two years, but he's had uh, a wide range of jobs in the uh, industry for over 16 years now and water conservation is something that is very special to him. So uh, without really any further ado, I want to turn that over to Greg. Hey, thanks, Jake. Great introduction, man. Uh, I want to thank Jake and the Land Effects team for hosting the webinar today. We're all here to talk about a topic that I'm very passionate about, and that's water conservation. Uh, I'm from Southern California, where water is normally in high demand and short supply. So you can imagine this is a pretty, uh, pretty hot topic for us. During my time in landscape architecture, I managed an account with the uh, Southern California's largest supplier of water. We had the opportunity to kind of perform uh, over 300 audits. And in that time, I discovered a lot of ways that you can waste water. So I'm gonna see if we can kind of address some of those today. So we're all aware that water is a limited resource. And in fact, about 2% of the planet's water is actually available for human consumption. It's crazy, but it's true. The rest is either salt water found in the oceans, fresh water frozen in polar ice caps, or water that's just too inaccessible for practical usage. Uh, nationally, outdoor water use accounts for 30% of household use, yet can be much higher in drier parts of the country, like Southern California, where we are a dry desert climate. Um, of the water used for irrigation, only about 65% of that or about 65% of that water is wasted due to things like uh, irrigation schedules that exceed watering need for the plant material, uh, often due to kind of a misunderstanding of precipitation rates, plant water needs, things like that. Poor distribution uniformity, we'll talk about that. Runoff on surface and uh, irrigating past root zones and system leaks, those are a big one. Um, so learning about smart water practices is really becoming increasingly important now and for the future. Some of the topics we discussed today will be directly related to California water restrictions and regulations, but really I think it's a good place to start. California has some of the most stringent legislation for water uh, and water conservation that I know of, uh, but there is an increasing demand for water conservation programs in different states around the country uh, and around the world for that fact, for that matter. As demand for water increases, supply is gonna be a growing concern. It's important to look at how we're using water around the world and determine how we can eliminate water waste wherever possible. So we're all here because we understand that there is a need for water conservation in the industry. Uh, so today, the topics I wanna to spend some time on are common terms that we typically talk about in water conservation and scheduling, uh, water restrictions and regulations, and we'll also talk a bit about designing responsibly with water conservation in mind. So let's dive into some of the common water conservation terms that we see in the industry. Uh, and if there's a term that 
I don't note here or I don't cover and you think it's worth discussing, please make mention to it in the chat and we'll try to circle back to that later. But uh, here's, the, here's the terms I wanna talk about. Distribution uniformity, evapotranspiration, reference ET or reference evapotranspiration, crop ET or crop coefficient, uh, WUCLs, uh, water use classification of landscape species. I'm sure we've all seen that. Uh, CIMIS, the California Irrigation Management System uh, or Information System. MWELO or MWELO or MWELO, whatever you want to call it. It's the Model, model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance. And MAWA, Maximum Applied Water Allowance. And ETWU, which is the Estimated Total Water Use. So to dive into distribution uniformity, this is a measure of the uniformity or evenness of irrigation water being applied over a given area. So it's the evenness that it's hitting the surface area of that landscape. Uh, the illustration here shows the difference between sprays with a slightly lower DU uh, against higher efficient multi-stream rotary nozzles with a high DU. Your typical spray is going to have heavily saturated areas around the head uh, in a typical head-to-head -head coverage situation. A lower DU leaves the area in the middle slightly under irrigated like you see in the image and leaves us uh, with unevenly irrigated root zones. This leads to increased run times to flood irrigate the middle area to equalize the amount of water that we need for that middle area. Uh, with multi-trajectory stream nozzles like the MP rotator, a slower application rate and a higher distribution uniformity leave us with a more uniformly irrigated root zone, which becomes a water saver because we don't need to irrigate through the root zone in other areas because we're evenly distributing that water. And it moves me on to evapotranspiration or commonly seen as ET. So ET stands for evapotranspiration. And it's the combination of two words, evaporation and transpiration. Everyone knows that evaporation, uh, what evaporation is, because I'm sure we've all left a glass of water outside for a day or two and come back to see the water level had gone down or completely vanished like magic. Uh, the, the transpiration is something that many of us experience every time we're outside on a hot day. We sweat or we transpire because our bodies are working hard and they need to cool themselves. And plants do the same thing. They need to use moisture in the soil uh, to grow. And with direct sunlight on them, they're being taxed and they need to sweat so they can stay cool and stay alive. So ET is a measurement of how much water the plant is using and how water is being evaporated from the soil by the sun. The calculation really identifies how much water we need to give back to the plants on our next run cycle. So, uh, we're, if we're understanding that, I think we can move on to the next one, which is ETO or reference evapotranspiration. Um, reference ET represents evapotranspiration of a large field of four to seven inches of tall, cool season grass uh, that is actually well watered. So we're watering to its highest possible potential. The crop most often used uh, as a cool season grass is alfalfa grass and full sun exposure. And reference ET is used as the basis of determining the maximum applied water allowance, or MAWA, uh, so the regional difference in climate can be accommodated. Uh, not all plants have the same replenishment requirements as alfalfa, so it's important to know what percentage of reference ET your plants require, uh, which is known as kind of a, as, as this next one, a crop coefficient or a plant factor. So a plant factor is uh, multiplied by ETO and, it's, and it estimates the amount of water a specific type of plant needs. So for the purpose of the ordinance we're gonna talk about, uh, plant factor ranges are high water use, uh, 0.7 to one, moderate water, 0.4 to 0.6, and low water, zero to 0.3. It notes that there's a very low category, which would be, um, that would be a, a little bit lower than low water, but in the actual MWILO documentation, they note that there's high water, moderate water, and low water. Um, moving on here. So plant factors are cited in the ordinance 
or an emwilo, and were derived from wukuls, uh, or the water use classification of landscape species. So wukuls is managed by the University of California and funded by the California Department of Water Resources. Uh, if you're not familiar with WUCLs, it provides an evaluation of the water needs for plant material used in California. And actually they have, uh, they make reference to over 3,500 plants in this documentation. So the information there is valuable. And to determine what the plant requirement is, we need to first know what the reference ETO is. Um, so M. Wilo makes reference to CIMIS, which is the California Irrigation Management Information System. Uh, say that 10 times. CIMIS has over 140 very accurate weather stations throughout California. So data is stored for historical use and it's used for daily use. So you can actually go on there and see what daily ET values are uh, on their website as well. So that's CIMIS. And AB 1881, was one of the state of California's initial pushes to have regulatory legislation in water use and conservation for landscape water use. Uh, the bill was originally approved by Governor Brown back in 2006, but uh, it really, it actually has quotes to legislation dating back to the 90s. So this documentation has been in process for a long time and we've been thinking about water conservation for a long time. AB 1881 specifies that local agencies in California must adopt a model water efficient landscape ordinance set forth in this bill uh, or something equivalent or more stringent than the model water efficient landscape ordinance that's in the bill. So MWILO is specific to the management of landscape water use. It was most recently updated back in 2015 and there are plans to update it again very soon. Uh, in fact, collaborators are, collaborators are already working on discussing uh, the updates. So not sure when the actual date that the, the update will come out is, but they're working on it. So Appendix B, which is on your screen, is the Water Efficient Landscape Worksheet. And this should be filled out and submitted with your landscape document package. And in the next few slides, I'll discuss what everything in this sheet really means. So MAWA is the maximum applied water allowance and is the upper limit of annual applied water for the established landscape area. Uh, this is based on the area's reference ET and ET adjustment factor and the size of the landscape area. So maximum applied water is used to determine the amount of water a project is allowed to use for landscape purposes. And to break it down a little bit, uh, ETAF for MAWA is predetermined at 0.55 for residential properties and 0.45 for non-residential properties. So a little bit more stringent for non-residential. Uh, landscape areas account for the total landscape area of the entire project, including special landscape areas. And SLAs or special landscape areas uh, are solely dedicated to edible plants, such as orchards and vegetables, um, areas irrigated with, with recycled water and uh, recreational areas. Um, and it's not to exceed uh, one or 1.0 on the ETAF. So projects must be designed with an estimated total water use or an ETWU that is less than the limit allowed in the MAWA calculation. So basically our ETWU calculation that we'll go over shortly must be lower than the MAWA calculation to be compliant. So I want to through, run you through a quick example of calculating MAWA. Um, in this hypothetical residential property in Fresno, California, the landscape area is uh, 50,000 square feet. This particular property does not have special landscape areas and the annual ETO is 51.1 inches. So in the calculation, we multiply ETO by 0.62, which is a, com, uh, con, a conversion factor to gallons per square feet. And we then multiply that by the total of the ETAF, which is either 0.55 or 0.45 in this case, because it is residential, we're using 0.55 times total landscape area plus 
one minus the ETAF times zero and zero because we don't have any special landscape areas in this example. So if you did, you would add that in right there. Um, let me go back a slide. So as we run through that calculation, we're going to see that we come up with um, 871,255 uh, gallons per year, which we need to determine, we need to convert that to 100 cubic feet per year, or units uh, in some cases. So we would divide that by 748 gallons, which is one cubic foot. So if we divide it by that conversion factor, then we get 1,165 HCFs or 100 cubic feet. Now, ETWU, or the estimated total water use, is used to calculate estimated amounts of water used in the landscape area. Projects, like I mentioned, must be designed with an estimated total water use that is less than the limit allowed for the MAWA calculation. The ETWU calculation has a slight variance in the way that we determine ETAF. In this case, ETAF is determined by calculating the plant factor divided by the irrigation efficiency. And you'll note on the screen that irrigation efficiencies are 0.75 or 75% for overhead irrigation and 0.8 for drip irrigation. So we can see that drip is considered more efficient than uh, overhead irrigation. So when we see ETAF, in the ETWU calculation, remember to divide the plant factor by the irrigation efficiency. So let's look at an example here. I'm gonna go through one hydrozone um, and give you an example of how that's calculated. So here we're going to determine ETWU of an irrigated landscape using the same numbers that we had from our previous example because we're comparing ETWU versus MAWA. So in the same example, we had 50,000 square feet of landscape and the reference ET was 51.1 inches. So if you have different types of plant material and different types of irrigation, you'll need to calculate each hydrozone out individually. So hydrozones um, that have the same type of irrigation and the same type of plant, uh, same plant factor can all be combined into one calculated out uh, as one. So only if there's variance in your plant factor or your sprinkler type. For hydrozone, uh, for hydrozone number one, we have overhead irrigation with a high water use plant material with a plant factor of 0.8. And because it's overhead irrigation, we're gonna use that irrigation efficiency of 0.75. This particular hydrozone has 7,000 square feet of landscape. And to determine the ETWU for this hydrozone, we need to multiply the reference ET by of, uh, sorry, of 51.1 times our constant that we saw in the last example of 0.62 times ETAF, which in this case would be 0.8 divided by 0.75 because we have overhead irrigation and a plant factor of 0.8. Then we multiply the landscape area of 7,000 square feet oh sorry, then we multiply the landscape area of 7,000 square feet Therefore, hydrozone number one would be 236,559 gallons per year or 317 HCFs or 100 cubic feet. We do this for each hydrozone on the product, or project, like we mentioned, if they, if they vary from hydrozone to hydrozone. And then we would calculate it all up and have the sum of all the hydrozones in this example. And what I came up with in this calculation was 1,34500 1, cubic feet as the total sum of the ETWU in this calculation. So in our MAWA example, we had a total of 1,165 HCF. And in the ETWU, we had 1,345 HCF because ETWU cannot exceed MAWA plant material or irrigation methods must be adjusted in the ETWU uh, down so that it would then be less than the MAWA. So this calculation would not work. And if we input that into the worksheet, we will note that the, it will not work. And we're going to need to cycle back to that and figure out how we can lower the ETWU so that we make sure that we're in compliance. 
So I hope this kind of helped clarify some of that. And Jake actually um, put together a really awesome spreadsheet that uh, if you're interested in, he can share with you that really goes over, uh, or it, it really simplifies the process so that you can just go through for each one of your hydrozones, pick the landscape type or the plant factor and your irrigation method, and it will automatically calculate what all of your hydrozones are. And so uh, it's a really great tool if you're doing a lot of these calculations, if you're doing a lot of design in California, it makes your life a little bit easier. You can take that information copy it from his spreadsheet and just dump it right into your plans, right into land effects and um, comply with the MLULA requirements for the state of California. So I guess this would be a good time if we had any questions come up uh, to talk about them. Anything yes. else we need to talk about here, Jake? Yeah, why don't we handle a couple of these? So. Um, Daniel actually asked, uh, and this is just a, a great question in general. Um, he's asking why drip irrigation is considered only slightly more efficient than overhead. Um, point, um, 0.75 versus 0.8. So, yeah, that's a great question. And I, I can't tell you exactly why they determined that it would be 0.81, but there is a lot of variation in what type of drip you're using and the efficiency would then um, depend on how densely your landscape is uh, laid out. If you're using point source, if you're using inline, um, if you're using subsurface, on surface. So I think that they generalized it as a 0.81 to be on the lower end of the spectrum, but he is absolutely right that drip irrigation is typically going to be up in the 0.9 region uh, for efficiency levels. So this was, I think, their up their attempt to just generalize it and go for the uh, lesser option. Yeah, and I, I'm gonna sort of tack onto that too in, in my auditor's experience stuff is as we calculated some of those um, irrigation efficiencies, 0.65 was like some of the, you can't go below that without it failing those kind of efficiency tests. Right. Um, so I think two point seven five is is being a little little generous in some cases, especially on um, existing irrigation systems. So I don't know if you had any thing to determine, you know, how to determine what the irrigation efficiency is, other than auditing a system to really see what the the efficiency is on a system or what. But well. A manufacturer is going to tell you what the efficiency is in a perfect, you know, perfect world under perfect conditions. Um, but there's really, to really determine what the efficiencies are in the field and how well it's designed, whether or not you have head to head coverage or in drip, uh, you have really even layout. Uh, you're going to have to do an audit on site to determine what that is. So I think that they're just generalizing, you know, a, a decent install of drip irrigation and that could be down as low as 0.81. Um, and I even think that with overhead irrigation, 0.75 is pretty generous in, in uh, a number for overhead irrigation and its efficiencies. So I don't know if they'll update any of those numbers in the next iteration, but uh, it's something to think about when you're looking at what these numbers mean and, and what they are on paper versus what you would find in the field as well. Yeah, and, and uh another question here too then is uh, along with that irrigation efficiency is is that um of the overhead sprinkler type using mp rotor spray head or rotor and i would say it's kind of like the drip scenario where it's it's a accumulation of anything overhead would you agree to that well it eliminates the use of sprays um for overhead irrigation because they can't reach those those efficiency numbers um, typically it's going to be rotary type nozzles, high efficiency rotary type nozzles or gear driven rotors that are going to classify in that overhead irrigation category. Perfect. That's okay. Um, yeah. And then another question then, um, as we factor in these calculations, how, how are the wet or dry years factored into the calculations? The wet or dry years. Yeah, I, I would assume they're talking about the ET or the reference ET 
for a year. I would assume it's just based on what that reference ET is for the year, regardless of wet or dry. Is that yeah, so they're going to use, um, in the calculation itself, they're going to use historical ET, and that's actually referenced in Appendix A of the Model Water Landscape of Ordinance, the MWILO. So you can actually go into Appendix A and see what all those reference ETs are for the states and counties in uh, California. Uh, if you wanted to do your own calculation of last year's ET, to compare it to historic, uh, that's doable, but all the reference information is uh, from historical ET. Cool. And that is based off of information from Simis. Perfect. And Chad has a, a, a great question, and this is sort of uh, why we're kind of doing this, this webinar too, is he's asking what counties or cities require these calculations and why do some require it and others do not? Well, like I, like I mentioned, um, in California, you are required, and there is some issue with um, enforcement of this and who's doing what, but you are required to adopt this model water ordinance or something more stringent, and that's all written in the legislation in the bill. So if you're not conforming to it, it's probably because you're not following the rules. Um, so refer to your local uh, restrictions and water uses and their landscape ordinances based on what they've come up with because each county and city may be slightly different. So if they're not doing any of this, there probably should be and they probably will be soon. Cool. And then last one um, for now. Uh, Wukul's does not give you a plant factor, but only the low, medium, high, or very low. So what do you do um, or what do you go by to identify a plant factor that's within the range of that like 0. 0.4 to 0. 0.6? Is it just, you know, is it based on the plant or, or how are you making the determination of which one to specifically pick? Um, that's, you know, that's a great question. And you can actually find some of that information. Um, there's a book by Bob Perry that makes reference to some of those specific plant factors. Um, but typically the plants note that it is a high or a low or a medium in a certain um, sun exposure region. So I would say that if it was a full sun exposure, um, that would be on the lower end and a moderate sun exposure, that would be in a, a little bit higher end, I suppose. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, I mean, it does to me. So uh, Deborah, please chime in if you have further questions with that. I would also say that it does state as you're picking those that actual plant factor to err on the high side of that item. So if you're juggling between um, you know two plants that are within the same zone or something like that, that you're always going to be going for worst case scenario. So just err err on that higher percentage to make sure that you're covered with what it is, so. All right, I'm gonna let you keep going and we'll uh, handle questions later as they come up. Okay, and there's a lot of information in this topic uh, for MWILO and AB 1881 that go into more detail about uh, requirements of a water audit being done before the uh, final inspection on the site can be done to turn over occupancy permits and things like that. Uh, that is a growing topic and concern is it wasn't really noted uh, or it wasn't really enforced up front the, the need for an irrigation audit to be done uh, at, at completion of the construction. But that's something that you know I'm, I hear a lot more about is people looking for auditors to come out and audit their site so that they can write it off. And it's normally a last minute thing. So that would be a, a CLIA, a certified landscape irrigation auditor or a qualified water efficient landscaper quell um, look at your local counties uh, they might offer that in your area or the irrigation association offers that clea if you're interested in doing these audits or looking for somebody who is a certified auditor so those are 
that's a little tidbit of information that I think is a little bit unclear and who can do these things. So uh, if you go to the Quell website or the IA's website, you can see a list of certified auditors uh, that can actually do that work for you. Okay, so I wanna move on to kind of designing responsibly. So we know that we have a limit to how much in Mwilo, how much of a certain landscape we can use, how many highs we can use, mediums and lows to conform and make sure that we're falling into those MAWA uh, requirements. So be selective, even if you're not in these, you're not falling under these Mwilo legislations and things like that, be selective in your plant, in your planning process and only put grass in areas where you know that the public are gonna use it and people are gonna use it for games, uh, sporting events, other events, picnics, things like that and use drought, more drought tolerant plant material in areas outside of the turf zones. So none of those really high water use shrubs and things like that. Start looking at more options for water conservation and low water use plant material. Uh, there's a huge plant palette of these types of plants that just look amazing and can really add a lot of nice color to a landscape. So some people are always afraid, some people are afraid to use drought tolerant plant material because they think that it looks bland and stuff, but there's a lot out there that's really pretty with a lot of vibrant colors. So be considering those options when you're doing your landscape design. And it's not a bad idea to have your own water conservation checklist so that wherever you live in the world, uh, when you're designing a, a site and trying to determine what you're going to do on that site to conserve water and eliminate water waste. Um, make sure that that design is high efficient and you can maximize your water savings. So look at, look at all the things that we've talked about and look at some other options in um, product selection that are higher efficient than your traditional options. Because chances are, if you're in a state that has some worry about water availability, there's a good chance that they're going to be adopting some regulations and restrictions as well if they don't already have them in place that are going to start restricting you on what you can design with and stuff like that. So keep that in mind when you're doing your designs and when you're coming up with some sort of checklist on water conservation and your designs. And specking mulch in planters with your design uh, it keeps moisture in the soil, manages soil temperature, acts as a weed barrier. Uh, depending on what type of bark mulch you're using, it can give nutrients back to the plant material as it breaks down. And if you are using drip line, uh, which it's stated in Amwilo that if you apply mulch to your landscape areas that you should be using a slow application of water, which drip is, to make sure it permeates through the mulched area and into the soil without creating runoff. So Cover up, cover up that beautiful drip line. Um, and it's really important to use because it does help out the plant material and it does help the longevity of the plant material itself. So consider those types of things in your design. And also consider the smart control sensor techno smart controller and sensor technology. It's important in designing with proven water savers. Uh, and I wanna transition now to kind of the electronic technology world of irrigation. Um, a lot of technology is playing into the way that we irrigate our landscapes and we come up and we've come really a long way from the days of, you know, hydraulic rotary dial clock timers and all that kind of crazy stuff. So in, in Mwilo, they are requiring that we use smart controllers. So smart controllers create another opportunity for substantial water savings. A common question we hear in the industry is, how much water can a smart controller save me? And really the answer is how much water are you wasting? So this is gonna be, this is gonna vary from situation to situation. If you are on top of uh, water management, if you've created tight schedules, the water savings potential isn't quite as high, but if this is a, if you're putting this into a property that's not highly managed, uh, there's a lot of potential there. So the question should be, how can a smart controller save me water? And I'm gonna give you a demonstration of how a weather-based irrigation timer or an ET-based irrigation timer can do that for you. So 
brings us back to ET and what the plant really needs. It's important to think about this when we're scheduling our irrigation systems. And in the Northern Hemisphere, this is an example of the dark area on this graph is an example of what ET is, looks like throughout the year um, and the plants needs around the year. So the orange line in this diagram signifies what traditional seasonal adjustment looks like without a smart controller. So there's typically a ramp up of irrigation in spring. Um, and as it starts to warm up, then it's typically left there through the summer until fall. Uh, once it starts to feel a little bit cooler and then it gets adjusted back down. So some regions with cooler climates will have the system shut down um, and winterize for the cold months. But this is kind of a typical pattern of what we're seeing with uh, irrigation management. So if, we're, if we adjust the system daily based on the needs of the plant material using our ET calculation or a smart controller that uses historical data, to manage the system, the water savings that we can see and that potential for water savings is that light blue area on the graph. So it would be changing every day based on ET requirements and there's a huge potential for water savings there. So what that would look like in a scheduling scenario would be, uh, we set our run times for the hottest time of the year, then the smart controller with the weather station begins scaling the programming up or down to adjust for those changes in weather. So in this example, you see 100% of the runtime set at mid peak or mid summer peak demand for the year. In this next, next example, if the weather on any given day becomes hotter or cooler than your peak irrigation day, the controller will take over and either scale your run times up or it'll scale it down. So in this example, the controller determined it could scale the watering back by 30% because the weather was cooler and cloudier than usual. So each station was reduced by 10 minutes, saving 40 minutes of irrigation time and puts money right back into uh, your pocket, the owner's pocket, um, whatever. So that's an opportunity for water savings right there. And if you have more than four stations, if you have a 50 station uh, site, you can imagine how much water that would be saving. So, if you're not sure what the peak runtime should be, um, there's a couple of things. We can do our scheduling calculations that we do um, for design. And also, uh, Hunter has a free runtime calculator on our website under the Professionals tab where you can actually put all your uh, site information in and generate a schedule. And there's a way that uh, for specifiers or designers, you can actually go in there, create those schedules, and then pull a document out to drop into your design plan for uh, your establishment schedule and your established plant material schedule. So another great smart sensor option is soil moisture sensors. And soil moisture sensors determine how much water is actually available in the soil for the plant material to use. Uh, once enough moisture is depleted from the soil, the sensor allows the controller to irrigate. So if the controller tries to irrigate and it says, hey, I need to water, but the sensor determines that there's enough moisture in the soil that it doesn't need to irrigate, then it won't allow it to irrigate, which will obviously save water because then you're not watering past the root zone and you're not applying water when it doesn't need to be watered. Uh, this helps eliminate the guesswork of determining how much water is actually available in the root zone. So great option for water savings potential. And then by combining a weather sensor and a soil sensor, you're really getting the best of both worlds. Uh, because the controller knows what's going on above ground because it has the above ground solar sink or weather sensor. And then it actually knows what's happening below ground and how much water is available for the plant material uh, below ground. So doubling up, not a bad idea. Uh, every site though in the MWILO uh, AB1801 bylaws or in the legislation states that every site must have a smart controller with a at least a rain click sensor type thing. So if there is a rain event on site, it will automatically shut down the controller and any measurable rainfall, which is 0.1 inches of rain, uh, would be shut down for at least uh, 72 hours. Or rather, uh, 
Oh, 42 hours, 48, 48 hours. Minimum of two days. So now the newest in smart controller technology is web-based Wi-Fi control. These controllers really give you the access to the irrigation system from essentially anywhere in the world. And it monitors a system while no one's on site. So when you spec this, you also have the ability to use the smartphone or web connected device as a maintenance remote, or the, you have the ability to program the controllers off site. Um, and it can be a benefit to the installer, the end user, and um, benefit to the designer because it falls into the, the category of a smart controller for the Amwilo stuff. So HydroWise uses predictive watering to determine what the plants are going to need before they actually even need it using a really refined uh, weather forecasting service. So this is a great controller that checks all the boxes for Amwilo's smart controller requirements. And uh, it's actually looking at what's gonna happen in the weather the next day. So it can kind of predict how much you need to put, how much water you need to give back to the plant material ahead of time. But it also has uh, measurements of what happened the day before. So it can actually use historical ET data, current ET data, and use forecasted predictions to make uh, refined adjustments. So pretty awesome tool there. Uh, and this keeps plants healthier and helps to prevent heavy stress when you know hot spells move through or you know it gets hotter than you you originally anticipated so in combination with smart controllers let's talk about flow sensors and how they can be combined with a controller to say help save water uh, and flow sensors are essentially an inexpensive insurance policy for an irrigation system uh, flow sensor We'll calculate how much flow is running through your system when the stations are activated and alert and send an alert to the controller uh, if flows become higher than what should be expected in the event that there's a broken main line, lateral line, or maybe a missing head or missing nozzle. Um, so consider that and a flow sensor is required actually on all uh, residential projects, on all projects residential and non-residential over 5,000 square feet in Emwilo, and Emwilo also requires a submeter or dedicated irrigation meter on non-residential projects over 1,000 square feet, and then any, resi any residential project over 5,000 square feet. So uh, a meter like you see on the left side of the screen can serve as a dual purpose for a submeter and a flow sensor. So something to think about in your designs as well. Now, I wanna really quickly talk about um, precipitation rates versus infiltration rates and how we're going to design our irrigation systems with soil in mind and what, and what the soil has the ability to do and how, how fast or how quickly it can take water in. Uh, I'm not, I know there's some uh, webinars on Land Effects page about soil and soil inf infiltration and information about that. Uh, but this is why it's so important to look at or to get a soils report before the plan is designed because precipitation rate is the speed at which water is being applied to a specific area, uh, usually represented in inches per hour. And the infiltration rate is the velocity or speed at which water enters the soil. So we need to know, so it's really important to know the soil type in your parks, public spaces, whatever you're designing, so that it'll guide your decision on what application method to use in your design or retrofit. So this chart explains which application methods are appropriate for different soil types. And sprinklers with higher precipitation rates like sprays should be used to irrigate coarse sandy soils with faster infiltration rates while finer soils should be irrigated with a, at a slower rate of speed. So something like drip or MP rotators or a gear driven rotor. So remember, slow the flow down to apply water at a rate that your soil can absorb it. And so when we're designing that, we need to know what type of soil we have on site. So we know which application methods we can use in our design. It's really important because otherwise, we have too high of a flow or too high of a precip rate on a fine type clay-like soil, our run times are gonna be very short, it's gonna be hard to manage, and we'll probably have a lot of surface runoff 
uh, and water waste because of it. So keep that in mind. And again, there's a, a, a slew of presentations about pressure regulation and my colleague at Hunter did a pressure regulation webinar with uh, Land Effects a while back that's on the website. But I just wanted to quickly touch on water savings in pressure regulation. So this was a test that we performed on site to determine how much water is wasted when a nozzle is removed from a head. And I think this is a really cool slide because it gives you uh, visuals and an idea of how much water is actually being wasted. So on the left side, there is a head, non-pressure regulated, and the nozzle's been removed. It's outputting 30 gallons per minute, while the middle image is a pressure regulated head at 30 PSI, so this is our PRS 30, and with the nozzle removed, it's only putting out six gallons per minute. So it's a 24 gallon per minute differential just by adding pressure regulation on that head. Now, we also added a feature um, to the PRS 30 with flow guard. So this is a different model number, but the flow guard feature is the, actually the right image there. And uh, it's pressure regulated with the addition of a little plunger built in that when the nozzle's removed, uh, moves into place and actually directs water out of a very small port. So with the nozzle being removed in this case at 30 PSI of pressure regulation, we're only putting out half a gallon per minute. And we're actually putting a 10 foot tall um, identification stream out of that sprinkler so that if a uh, nozzle's removed, you're not gonna have a dip in pressure because of the high flow coming out of that nozzle. And you're also gonna have an identifier stream so that the maintenance people down the road know that there's an issue right there and they can go back and fix it. So uh, this can lead to some big water savings potentials and it's just kind of food for thought um, when you're putting your designs together and specifying which spray bodies to use and which products to use. So I'll quickly talk about drip irrigation and we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but uh, drip can be another huge opportunity for water savings uh, when replacing overhead type methods. So small spaces converted to drip, we can save upwards of 70% of water compared to sprays. Uh, install drip irrigation or spec drip irrigation to slowly apply moisture to the plant root zone. So if you do have those fine soil types, uh, consider drip irrigation with lower flows to eliminate runoff and uh, for areas where you are overhead irrigating. Um, to eliminate overspray and stuff like that. So drip helps to eliminate those types of things like overspray and runoff. Uh, install it under a layer of mulch to reduce evapotranspiration. And again, I mentioned that um, mulch has a lot of good features, but it also helps protect the, the drip tubing and uh, typically helps, the, uh, helps to keep the soil moist longer. So that's always a good choice. Uh, drip typically requires longer run times, but eliminates a lot of that environmental hindrances that come along with overhead irrigation. Uh, make sure that you understand what your output or your application rate is for your drip zones when you install it, depending on uh, emitter spacing, depending on uh, offset or line spacing, to make sure that when you're doing your scheduling that you account for uh, how, how much you're applying. because if you have tight spacing and tight emitter spacing uh, with a high flow, you're gonna water that area very, very quickly. And it might even be less than a spray zone. So look at those types of things. So there are a lot of drip applications that accommodate a lot of your needs. Uh, we offer point source drip irrigation, inline drip irrigation, HDL. Uh, we have subsurface, which would be our eco wrap which is a fleece lined emitter tubing, which helps distribute the water better. And then the eco mat, which I would say is probably one of the industry's highest uh, efficient drip irrigation methods because it's below ground. It has that fleece material in between the emitter lines and all the way up and down the emitters or the lines themselves. So that really helps distribute the water evenly throughout the root zone 
no matter what type of uh, soil type you're using, so, or that you have on site. So some considerations there with drip. Uh, before I close out here, I did want to make mention uh, that there is a site on our webpage at hunterindustries.com uh, for designers that has a lot of helpful tools to help you manage uh, your designs, your uh, business, and things like that, and marketing needs. So definitely feel free to check that out. And then also, because this is my world, uh, I wanted to make mention to our training website. So if you have new employees or you just want to learn more about our products and different methods of insulation and management we have a lot of stuff on our training website for free all you have to do is go to training.hunterindustries.com make an account for free and you're up and running that day with um, hundreds of videos and modules to help you understand and learn irrigation uh, better for you and your staff so Definitely feel free to visit there and help us out. And that's all I have for you. So thank you all for joining in and, and listening to me talk. I'm going to turn it back over to Jake for questions and final notes, but please make sure you take down my information. If you have any further questions, you just want to talk about something or uh, you're looking for specific trainings for your, your staff or yourself. Um, Jake. All right. Thank you so much, Greg. That was great information. We had um, a lot of good questions. A um, few more minutes left here. So I will remind everybody the Q&A, please go ahead and uh, write in your final questions if you have any regarding any of the stuff today. Um, definitely uh, an eye opener from a product standpoint to design standpoint, just what to consider as far as water conservation is concerned. Um, and then just getting into all those acronyms, it's, it's really like speaking another language. So just reminding everybody that, uh, you know, California does sort of lead in, in that whole water conservation goal and you know, one of the questions that I do have is, you know, from a, a WUCL standpoint and even just uh, MAWA, ETWU, any of those types of things, um, how would you apply those to other states? You know, people who don't have those ordinances quite yet, is it, is it, uh, would you start with just using the numbers for California or is there a better way of kind of applying that to other, other locations? Are you talking about the... ET historical ET data. Yeah, and, and just what what uh, Wukels represents for the plants that might still be used in other regions and areas outside of California. Um, just yeah. determining that kind of stuff. I think Wukels is a great opportunity to to see what plant material is out there and what kind of climates it it thrives in. Um, California has a wide variety of climates. I mean, it's colder up north, it's warmer down south. We have a lot of different climate changes within the state. It is a very tall state. So a lot of these plant materials can apply to areas all over the country and all over the world. So it would be worth looking at to see if there's plant materials there that can help out with your design and being more water conscious um, and see if it actually would thrive in your area. Uh, you could use the MAWA calculation to determine what your site is going to use. And you can use the uh, ETWU calculation to look through your hydro zones and find information from other sources too on landscape material that may not be li listed in WUCLs uh, to help determine what might, what that percentage of, or what that plant factor might be so that you can kind of run the same calculations and see how much water you're going to be using per year on your site, because that's important information, especially in water management. So if you're a water manager, or you do water management in your firm, it's a great idea. It's a great way to determine how much water you're going to use uh, throughout the year for those reasons too. So I would expect to see a lot of these same practices and a lot of these same regulations that are put into this ordinance to start spreading uh, around the country and being more prevalent in, uh, in other areas with arid dry climates and 
um, you know, water supply shortages. Cool. And uh, to go along with, with all those uh, plant factor stuff, uh, Deborah is asking if an existing pool is still a plant factor of one. And I'm assuming pools are considered that special landscape area and yeah, they, they get applied the one. Yes. And um, yeah, you have a high amount of evaporation from pools. So it's basically just a big... Uh, big evaporation pan. So yeah. <laughs> cool. Definitely and special landscape area. Okay. And then uh, I think that's all the questions that we've gotten so far. So again, I want to thank uh, Greg for doing that and uh, thanks everybody for attending. And one final little side note, um, as a reminder, we here at Land Effects, we're currently hosting a photo contest for um, all of you users that have been a, a client for a year or more definitely enter and win some really cool prizes. Uh, just really easy. Go over to landeffects.com and uh, click on our photo contest page and see the sort of the, the prizes and stuff that we got there. Really cool. And then um, Greg, some people are asking for the file that you, uh, you had. So um, if you're cool with, releasing that we can post it on the recorded um, side of our website yeah feel free to uh to add that pdf on there okay cool i will uh i will make sure that gets uh posted along with that excel spreadsheet for people to use um as they so choose so it's just a again another resource that we want to make available for people to to make these water conservation things happen so uh, thank you, everybody, again, and have a great Easter weekend. Thanks, Jake.